Despite their fearsome appearance, the Brute Wyverns Banbaro and Durambaros are actually herbivores. The first is a supposed resident of the Hoarfrost Reach, wrapped in a shaggy pelt and with moose-like antlers to uproot trees and earth as it fights and forages. The second, Durambaros, is the largest Brute Wyvern and one of the largest Wyverns in the series, wrapped in moss and fungi and with a hammer-like tail to knock down trees. The two are unusual as brute wyverns, given that they're herbivores. So what adaptations may they have for this lifestyle? And how may they impact their environments as giant gardeners of the new and old world? Maybe the first question anyone would have, especially for Durambaros, is how does a herbivore arise from a lineage of carnivores? A lot of vegetation, but especially rotting bark that Durambaros is known to eat, isn't exactly known for its role as an energy food, especially for animals that stem from a lineage of seemingly obligate carnivores. But the herbivorous brutes may not be so far removed from their predatory origins in terms of their digestive tract. Giant pandas, whilst often unfairly lambasted as evolutionary failures by the ignorant and dim-witted, actually have diets that lump much closer with their carnivorous relatives than more typical herbivores. Dietary selection of certain parts of bamboo at certain times of the year, as well as a digestive tract still resembling those of carnivores, mean that the primary macronutrients pandas extract from bamboo they eat is actually protein. Pandas lack the high retention times and long GI tracts for the breakdown of fibres, making up for this with specificity in diet as well as eating more bamboo to compensate. So in terms of the macronutrients they eat, pandas still register as carnivores. So with this, the herbivore brutes may not have had to make such an evolutionary leap at least to initially deal with the diet of plants. This may be the case for Bambaro especially, who isn't specified to consume as much direct tree material as Durambaros, and has less specified information on its internal morphology. For eating wood especially though, a lot of the times the wood can often just be the vehicle for tastier trees. Research on hadrosaur coprolites shows that when the dinosaurs would eat rotting wood, it may well have been for the crustaceans inside it too. Rotting wood can often become home to assorted invertebrates, which are loaded with protein and assorted minerals, as well as the direct polysaccharides Durambaros can break down from the wood itself. Crabs and other inverts may provide a dietary boost of protein and nutrients. There's also fungi, and similar coprolites suggest that hadrosaurs may have selected rotting wood due to the abundance of fungal elements in it. Fungi are typically saprophages, and so dead material is their bread and butter. Fungal attack on dead trees may not just provide Durambaros with an abundance of more edible fungi, but the effect of fungi on the tree too will likely make it more digestible for the Durambaros. Fungal attack breaks down the lignin, preventing the degradation of everything else, actually allowing it to properly break down the carbohydrates available. As an example from modern day too, Herbivores from the Holocene will select for certain species of rotting trees as a resource of sodium. Whilst sodium is something we typically have too much of in our diets, in a lot of natural ecosystems it can be hard to find if you don't eat other animals, and can be hard to find in rainforests especially. Some species of tree are toxic and inedible in life, but break down in death to be reasonable sources of sodium and are visited especially by assorted herbivores like dikers, elephants, and great apes, who all eat the rotting wood. A massive animal like Durambaros may well need good amounts of assorted minerals, and as well as being a frequent visitor of possible tree species with similar effects, it's also possible they may instinctively select to fell certain trees to generate this required resource. Durambaros is one of the few monsters we can actually take an inside look at, and it does seem that it has a multi-chambered stomach that may be somewhat analogous to some ungulates among other herbivores, and strongly suggests that Durambaros uses a form of rumination or an equivalent process, with a large fermentation chamber full of cellulase and other producing bacteria to break down the cell walls of plants and trees. This is versus the other method of herbivore digestion which is hindgut fermentation. Rumination allows for better breakdown of food, but over a longer period of time. 
So Duramboros may indeed spend long periods of its day ruminating due to how tough its diet of wood may be. This does fit with the relatively sluggish lifestyle both Duramboros and Bambaro are hinted to have, both through its time resting in the day, with Bambaro kicking back in hot springs to relax, plus the fact fungi and moss grow on Duramboros suggests long periods without much movement. This also suggests that Bambaro and certainly Duramboros have some pretty next level bacteria helping them digest here, as both an adaptation to such a bizarre diet and herbivory and brute wyverns in general. As feeding and ruminating compete for an animal's time budget, and by using African buffalo as a model organism to see if a ruminant is limited by either time or resource quality, it's suggested that long grazing times versus little rumination means that they're limited by their ability to find enough good food. In the wet season, buffalo spend more time ruminating and less time directly feeding as the forage is a lot more high quality, and they don't need to be as selective with what they eat. Duramboros's assumed long retention times would suggest it's doing well for forage quality, as well as quantity, and thus can digest rotting trees and wood very well indeed, and presumably its habitat selection means it's never short of trees and other forage to eat. But of course, rumination requires a suite of bacteria living in your digestive tract to assist you in the breakdown, and a lot of animals don't produce these naturally after birth. Rather, they have to be inherited from the mother by eating her feces. Koalas in particular are known for this, and produce a unique type of fecal matter called PAP, which is loaded with additional bacteria and microorganisms to help inoculate the joey as well as boost its immune system, similar to colostrum in mammals. Baby Duramboros typically can't eat wood right away, and instead go for softer, easier to digest food, like fungi, fruit, nuts, and their mother's excrement. Considering when hatched, Duramboros are only a meter or two in length, a diet of more energy-rich foods may help give them a growth spurt in early life, until they can get to the wood-eating stage at which point growth may slow down considerably due to the lower quality food and long rumination times. This may seem unpleasant, and indeed koalas are often mocked for it, but coprophagy is very common in herbivores. As well as koalas, it's often seen in numerous ungulates, in rodents too, and even in herbivorous birds like ptarmigan, all for the same purpose of inheriting the mother's gut biome. So this may not be unique to Duramboros, and may be seen in plenty of other monster hunter herbivores too, like Banbaro, the Blosswivens, and Lagombi. Interestingly, this can sometimes have negative side effects, and mothers with deficient gut flora pass this deficiency onto their young. A sickly mother Duramboros may only be able to produce inferior offspring with little chance of improving their circumstances. It may also be worth asking, how does this compare to the other herbivorous giants, the Blosswivens? Well, for Diablos, it may be somewhat analogous to the panda situation. Cacti and succulents are mainly just water and nutrients wrapped in an easily breakable cuticle protected by spines, over being very tough and heavily lignified. As cacti seem to have everything Diablos need and are relatively easy to digest due to their fleshy parts, Diablos may not need a hugely derived digestive tract in comparison to deal with them. Monoblos, on the other hand, may be somewhat analogous to a hindgut fermenter. Its mouth seems well suited to handling fibrous plants if it's similar to the dinosaurs it was based on. And if we cautiously assume it's not a ruminant, then Monoblos may be a hindgut fermenter like an elephant, and switches passage time in favour of eating more food to compensate, as well as relying on mastication to break down the cell walls of the plants it eats. This is a cautious analysis though, as the digestive systems of such animals may be more bizarre and derived than those of the dinosaurs they were initially based on. Once digested, Duramboros seems to store surplus nutrients as fat along its back in two large shelled humps, seeming to suggest that as a species they do seem to have some resilience against sudden drops in forage. Whilst they live in reasonable stable ecosystems, this could be some protection against droughts or mash tree die-offs that may affect food crops. Banbaro doesn't have this, but rather likely has subcutaneous fat spread over the body like blubber to keep it warm. Banbaro's fur and plating are also uniquely arranged to allow for heat retention or dispersion depending on the season and event. 
They can open their shells and raise the hair to allow heat to escape, and then close it back down again to trap it. This may allow Bambaro to have a greater range than initially thought, but also seems to suggest they may live in quite a seasonal world. The part of the Hoarfrost we visit is an extinct volcano, apparently rendered inactive by Shara Ishvalda's subterranean actions. We only ever get to see the maps in one season in-game, but it also seems unlikely that even with Elder influence, the Hoarfrost is cold all year round, even if it's specified as possibly the coldest location in-game to date. In the summer months, it may well be lush green and often sunny, with many monsters typically viewed as snow specialists also having to thrive in boreal forests or grassy steppes, as well as its abilities to change heat retention with its shell and fur, it may also be that Bambaro could molt or change pelage at certain times of the year as well. Through their lifestyles, both herbivorous brutes may also have significant impacts on the environments they live in that can be important for their persistence. Again, a diet at least partially made up of trees could influence this, as well as other interactions giant herbivores can have with them. Clearings are actually very important habitats in some rainforests, which whilst loaded with biodiversity don't often have extensive large mammal biomass. Much of the edible vegetation in the forest itself are seasonal fruits, with much other vegetation being toxic, nutrient poor, or inedible. Clearings such as Bais in Central Africa can provide water, essential minerals, and good herbaceous vegetation, and so become essential hotspots for many forest animals to visit. The Rambaros's tree felling habits may make it a creator of such areas and thus a vital component influencing the ecology of dense forest habitats. As well as creating them, Durambaros may also maintain and or enlarge them too. It's unknown if they supplement their diet with younger living trees, but as large horned animals they may also not need to to play a destructive role. Through rubbing themselves on trees as well as horning them, bison can uproot or kill young trees. Even if they aren't eating them, just scratching to relieve insect bites or itch the horns, especially when in conjunction with other environmental factors, can have a significant impact on saplings in an area, with bison maintaining open prairies and reducing woodland encroachment. As another giant horned animal that's far greater in size, similar activities on forest clearings and animal paths could easily lead to Durambros creating and stabilizing clearing areas through its day-to-day -day life. This also applies to Banbaro too, who as well as uprooting the ground through the course of its foraging, is also described as felling trees for bedding too. It's unknown if certain trees are selected for comfort, warmth retention, or parasite repellent, but Banbaro may have equivalent effects on the hoarfrost reach. In modern herbivores and likely Pleistocene ones too, opening areas up and halting shrub or wood encroachment prevents the trapping of heat, reduces albedo, and increases the residence of permafrost too. So Banbaro may actually be an underlooked contributing factor in keeping the hoarfrost cold. As well as influencing other large herbivores and thus the carnivores that eat them, this will have large impacts on the smaller life too. Certain plants may only get the chance to grow in Durambaros and Banbaro maintained clearings due to limited sunlight. Some birds like nightjars and woodcock, among others, may be forest birds, but they still require clearings to breed. What's more, some organisms prefer to occupy the stages of succession that are in between forest and clearing, and so require a rolling conveyor of destruction and regrowth for their ideal home. Again, the herbivore brutes may be instrumental in providing this. In a similar vein, Banbaro is also likely a major factor in keeping productivity in the hoarfrost reach up to a good level. Banbaro doesn't just plough the earth when in combat, it also feeds this way. Banbaro are described as uprooting soil and vegetation to get at roots and sprouts buried in the snow and soil all year round. It's mentioned this action has impacts on the soil, and improves it for further growth. This is much like the actions of large herbivores like wild boar, which rootle through large areas and cause huge disturbances to the soil often considered unsightly. But this can have significant and positive impacts on ecosystems, 
Soil disturbance increases species richness in rooted areas compared to non-rooted areas, and favours certain plants over others, like forbs over graminoids. Rooting also encouraged emergence of seedlings. It also increases leaf litter decomposition and can fix nitrogen in the soil better. All in all, rooting makes for better biodiversity and more productive soil. When we apply all of this specific context to Banbaro and the hoarfrost, it seems very likely that Banbaro is a key factor in keeping the hoarfrost as the environment that it is, having major impacts on the plants and soil that in turn facilitate the other herbivores able to persist there. It's then interesting to consider the role of large herbivores in the boreal ecosystems of Monster Hunter. Does Banbaro fill the role of Gamoth in the hoarfrost? Or are the hoarfrost and mainland boreal areas surprisingly different ecosystems out of just the large vertebrate fauna, all due to the differing roles and impacts of their respective mega herbivores? Duramboros is an incredibly large and resilient animal, with healthy adults being effectively immune to predation, and in a world of so many predators this may have some notable knock-on effects. The landscape of fear is a term used to describe how the risk of predation affects the choices prey animals make in its daily cycle of activity, and it can vary with things like age, season, and time of day as well. Vulnerable animals tend to focus their activities in safer areas as much as they can, with the resulting impact of their feeding and nutrient cycling being condensed to such areas. In contrast, mega herbivores are effectively immune to predation, and so are mostly exempt from the landscape of fear. Without having to worry about getting eaten, they can utilise high-risk areas as much as they like, and so counteract the effects of the landscape of fear on smaller at-risk herbivores. This allows them to transport nutrients from high-risk areas to low ones, and keep these areas enriched and seeded. In the world of Monster Hunter, this may be especially prevalent, not only for the diversity and ranges of top-order predators that will no doubt have large influences on the prey animals, but Capcom's persistent love of edgy, ecosystem-destroying monsters. For things like Devil Joe that not only eat large numbers of herbivores, but also likely have disproportionate impacts on the behaviour of the rest, animals like Duramboros can serve as an ecological counter to them still maintaining and stabilising the environments through their behaviour and nutrient cycling, despite Elder Dragon horseplay and the impacts of invader species. The individual Duramboros in an area may have different levels of said impact though. Mega herbivores aren't entirely immune for all of their lives, and it's mentioned that upon sexual maturity, Duramboros males disperse from their herd as they'd be related to most of the females in it. It could be female Duramboros with young below a certain age are still selective of habitat to reduce risk of predator encounter, whereas herds with young over a certain age, and the solitary bulls in particular, have disproportionate effects on negating the landscape of fear cast by the assorted predators too. This also seems to add Duramboros to the club of monsters where we only fight the males as well. The bulls seem to live solitary lives presumably only rejoining up with female herds to mate, and presumably aren't too kind to other bulls that stray into their territory. Unlike some of our modern herbivores, they're already well defended enough that they don't really need bachelor herds, and so a clash between two Duramboros bulls would be a hell of an event for the forest. For my thoughts on the duo, I'd say I like them quite a lot. Banbaro is a decent addition to Iceborne, and just pretty decent overall. The lore and the design are both quite enjoyable, it has a quite a nice fight with the great use of its horns that still feels very distinct from Diablos. The worst thing about it is without doubt its ridiculous role as an invader species. It's baffling you'd create something so tailor-made for a map and then give it this trait. Even with the explanations given, it's still pretty painful to say the least. He does also feel a bit weak for his size. Banbaro is absolutely massive and yet still gets clowned by Barioth and Beatodos, and this doesn't really do a lot for the notion that Capcom treats their herbivores like absolute jokes. Duramboros has a lot of potential, both in fights and in general. As a massive wyvern that's a pretty high quest rank to first fight, and one that has some thought put into how it lives, it's another monster I'm very keen to see get the world treatment. It'd be nice to see Duramboros almost styled to be the other side of the coin to Diablos, 
both giant herbivores with important roles in their ecosystems, but one ferocious, fast and active, whereas the other is comparatively indolent and peaceful, until it's disturbed. I also think a great map for Durambaros would be the first-gen jungle map. It's so dense and overgrown, it'd be perfect for the giant wyvern with literal plants growing on it. It'd also be nice to get some environmental behaviours in for it too, and I like the idea of resting Durambaros just blending seamlessly into the forest floor. I do think Durambaros's fight needs a major glow-up though. His big helicopter tail sweep jump might just be the most annoying time waste attack after Rathalos's world tour, and most of what early game pissings did in general. I know a lot of the fandom would probably burst into tears if it was taken out due to its iconic meme potential, but it's really just so obnoxious. It might also be that Durambaros doesn't have the most varied fight too that really inflates its frequency, but there's still a lot of potential there. I still subscribe to my own rule of innocent until proven guilty with a 5th gen and onwards update. Thanks for watching, and as ever a huge thanks to all my patrons, especially to Erengar Steiny for their generosity. If you'd like to contribute, there's a link in the description, and I'm grateful for any amount. A big thanks too to Goji for beginning the arduous task of much of the translations from the Iceborne book which is where a lot of the Bambro information came from, as well as for translating the Durambaros info too, which I'm greatly appreciative of. And a big thanks too to T Common Shark for allowing me to use his Durambaros video in mine. If you haven't already, check out his channel. He's got a lot of great behavioural shorts of the monsters in their natural environments. Considering 5th Gen has stopped doing the ecology videos, T Common Shark has effectively picked up the slack there, with his own wonderful independent works, so by all means give him a follow. To address some comments from last time, one occasionally brought up was Zamtrios's inflation. It is correct to point out that Zam inflates with air and not seawater, but I also think this is because he's fought on land. It'd be a bit awkward for it to submerge, inflate and then re-emerge again. Pufferfish can inflate with whatever medium they're suspended in, so I don't think it makes a huge difference. Well, it does to them as they tend to die if they inflate in air, but still. I feel inflation is still more analogous to pufferfish than frogs, as Zamtrios doesn't seem to use the inflating to make itself any louder or for its rage roar, so I don't think the two are linked. Some also argued Tetranodon is a better kappa than I initially thought, and fair enough. I do think the sumo aspect could have been separated from the kappa and given to something else though, as it's a bit undercutting to see Tetranodon be given this sport, especially considering Kappa are meant to be amazing at it, and then get the snot beaten out of it by everything other than a starter monster. And apparently Zora is based on a snapping turtle, so I guess I should say that I still want a snapping turtle monster that's actually good. The next video will be the Mer creatures from Season 2 of Primeval. Some of you have been waiting a while for it, so hopefully it'll deliver. And then it'll be back to Monster Hunter to see what the patrons have picked for you.